Hey everybody, it's Dale Jr. for another episode of the Dale Jr. Download. Mike, what we got on the show today? Well, Dale, it was a weekend of mistakes and accusations, I think, from Texas. Ooh. And you know how in Forrest Gump, Forrest says, Mama always has a way of explaining things so I can understand them? Yes. You're going to be my Mama Gump today because oh, no. I'm confused. All right. And you always have a way to explain things. So, Dale, this is your show. You're going to tell us all about these accusations and all the people and mistakes. NASCAR made mistakes. Top contenders made mistakes. You set us straight today. All right. Well, I'll try my best. Let's get to a couple tweets. Chase Elliott on how hard it was to pass at Texas. I don't know what genius decided to pave this place or take the banking out of turns one and two, but not a good move for the entertainment factor, in my opinion. It's great to hear driver feedback, especially after an event like that. You want to know what the drivers are thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Pretty ballsy. What, did you see what Eddie Gossage said in response? What did Eddie Gossage say? Eddie Gossage said, the asphalt has to age. Give it some time. Whether we like it or not, we have to repave every so often. Give it time. Yeah. I have to agree that they had to repave. I mean, okay, the track was weeping so badly they had to postpone the IndyCar event from uh, what year, 2016, 17, whatever? Yeah, no, 16, 15. 15? 15 maybe. A major event. This ain't a small thing to have to move a race to a completely different weekend because there's weepers in the track, even with a dry racetrack. They couldn't race the damn race. The track had to be repaved. It wasn't a choice of, man, you know, should we repave it or maybe we should, you know, what we've seen in Atlanta the last couple of years where they've kind of bent back and forth on possibly repaving it and not repaving it. That's not what's happening here. This track was in bad shape, needed a repave, so that had to happen. The reconfiguration, though, not sure that I would have done that. But that said, I think the reason, you know, the, the, the less banking in one and two is maybe the only thing that created passing <laughs> know, right? in the race. <laughs> Guys going down in there and getting moved up the racetrack. And we talked about it in the race. Uh, with the less banking, guys have to lift. You can hear it in the end cars where they're way off the throttle for a very long time down into the corner. That allows another guy, if he wants to be brave enough, to drive into the corner deeper and get to the bumper and move you out of the way. We saw it in the Xfinity race on the last lap. Here comes Cole Custer all over the back bumper. Can he get him loose? We saw it uh, when there was a pass for the lead to, uh, between Blaney and Harvick. Uh, you know, so I think that that reconfiguration actually created what little action we did have in the race. So, I don't know that I can blame the the lack of excitement in that event for the reconfig, but I can uh, I can say that the surface of the racetrack being new, I mean, we've seen it year after year. Anytime they've repaved a racetrack, that racetrack has not put on a good show. Let's talk about that, though. There's more things that play a role in the product of the weekend, the tire, the choice of tire. All right, and let's go to a tweet from Denny Hamlin. It's naive to think that the 19 package, this is the package that they're going to run next year. I haven't even started running it yet. (laughs) Less horsepower, more downforce. So it's naive to think that the 19 package will fix the one-lane race and we saw today. It's a tire track problem. The tire does not lay rubber. He's hoping that a completely redesigned car will be designed around a tire and wheel combination that is correct. He also goes on to say you can't even hardly find a car on the road today that has 15-inch wheels on it. We need something with a durable and tough sidewall to allow Goodyear to put a compound tread that lays rubber. That is what forces us to move off the bottom when the car lays rubber down on the racetrack. Until then, we will continue to chase a quote-unquote package. And so I have to kind of, that I kind of agree with most of that. In 2019, there's a new package coming. It's got more downforce, less horsepower. Mm-hmm. This is a stopgap to what will be eventually a new engine and, and, and a new prob- possibly a new design car. I don't know that they're going to redesign the car, but there is a new engine package coming in a couple of years that will be an open engine with 550 or whatever horsepower. Till then, we got this stopgap of a restricted engine. All right? A Band-Aid, if you will. Yeah, and that's okay, too. It helps us sort of understand where we're headed and what, what we need to do to fix it. What Denny's proposing is that if we're going to the, go to this package, which we are, it's it's happening, maybe we ought to have a different wheel, a different tire, a smaller tire, less tread width on the racetrack. I think that's a great idea. I've always thought that what's one way to slow the car? If you can't, you know, if you can't, if Goodyear cannot build a softer tire that is durable, if a Goodyear is afraid to build a tire soft that will degrade yet not destroy itself, 
maybe we don't need this much tire on the racetrack. Maybe a way to get guys to lift off the throttle is to take make the contact patch, the, tra the actual part of the tire that is touching the racetrack, make that smaller. So, basically, a lot of drivers disappointed in, you know, how difficult it was to pass. A lot of drivers saying, don't expect this next year's package to solve all of the issues. It is not a package. It, I mean, the package, I think, will be pretty interesting at races like that, racetracks like that. But is it going to be as great as it can be? No, it won't. It won't be until we figure all the things out that go along with the package. One of the most common things, one of the most important things to the racetrack is what connects it to the road. The tire is the most important component to all of this. Yes. All right. The package is important to to a, to an extent, but what the the rubber meets the road, man. That is what is the most important part of the whole equation. That's why Goodyear's job is the toughest job. Yeah. In the sport, tougher than the governing body. Sure. Goodyear is the key. Yeah. To, to all of our answers. Well, it, it has a significant role. Yeah. Because it's keeping the, pe the, the the pieces of machinery in place. That's right. In which to run, and and you're also asking it to to wear off so the it can produce good racing. I mean, who Give wants that job? Give me a tire that, that wears out, falls off, but but, but doesn't, doesn't blow but, up. But doesn't blow up. <laughs> All right, go and then and then let us complain about it when it doesn't go exactly our way. Which gets to my second question: yes. Is this a product of something else? There's a lot of other opinions. These are a product of the mile and a half tracks, repave or not. Yeah. This is you got other people. You know, you you yourself are on the more short track bandwagon. Yeah. You got people say NASCAR needs to eliminate the side force in the cars. I you agree got somebody with that. else. NASCAR needs to scrap the damn splitter. Somebody I else. agree with that. NASCAR NASCAR needs to listen to drivers more. I mean, it's like, well, well, where's the end game here? And that's where I'm kind of just. Well, like, you got close to it right there. Okay. Where, where about NASCAR doesn't need to listen to the drivers. NASCAR needs to listen to some drivers. <laughs> okay. Right? NASCAR doesn't need to listen to every single fan. When they have every when they, they they have opinions, they need to listen to some fans. Not every driver, not every fan, just some. They need to pick and choose the guys that they can trust and they believe are giving them the straight stuff and go to those guys and use those guys. We don't need a council, we don't need we don't need organization. Just pick a couple guys you trust, get them up in the holler every once in a while, take their take their information and use it. I don't have all the answers. I don't. Um, guys that have the answers are probably the guys that are driving the cars and they're working on the cars, all right? Um, I know that the engineers at Goodyear are super smart, but drivers know why and how and when a racetrack starts to work and widen out and, and become racy and fun. Drivers sense that and know that. They're out there on the track when it's happening. So those would be the guys I would be going to. I would pick a handful of drivers that I trusted and try to get, you know, try to get together and figure this out. There was uh, NASCAR admitting a major mistake that I thought was uh, compelling enough just in the fact that they admitted it and, and kind of very strong position that Steve O'Donnell took, and that had to do with the 48. Jimmy Johnson going through pre-race inspection on the day of, he failed it twice, but passed it a third time. I think the rule must be that you have to fail it three times. If you fail it three times, you get moved in the back. He got moved in the back even though he only failed it twice and did not – I think the kind of the bigger issue was that the team did not even get notified until they were, like, basically rolling off pit road and then hence the problem. Yeah, so we're lucky that Jimmy was not a playoff driver. Uh, but still, it's embarrassing. I think that NASCAR is certainly embarrassed by it. NASCAR admitted, look, we screwed up. We see the flaws in our communications, and, and we got to fix that. This can't happen again, and it's all on them. There was no, uh, you know, they put no responsibility on Chad or anyone but themselves. Tony Stewart took the took this stance. We're the only series in the world where you get to go through tech three times and fail twice. They still let you go through a third time. It shouldn't be this difficult. Yep. Help me understand why cars are failing tech two or three times each on race day to begin with, actually. I mean, that's, that, that's, a, that's a question that, you know, you, you guys that have been racing for ages on ages. I mean, I, I as a fan don't understand how you could be t uh, passing tech all weekend and then on race day you're failing so much that it, this becomes an issue. I like what Tony Stewart said. Why are we passing two, three times? Who cares about, pa you know, why? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a believer in a stern, strict system that penalizes and, and, and that has penalties and deterrents that are 
incredibly severe that would ke- that would make you never want to fail tech ever. We have a system that allows people to push and and f- you know flirt with the the gray area. It it should scare you from wanting to do that, you know, and not you know make you afraid of pushing the gray area. We need less rules. Like tech shouldn't be such a giant process. But the rules that we do keep, those are rules. And if you break those rules, that should be it. You know, I don't I don't care if it happens to my car. If I break a rule, if we're wrong, if you can prove to me and show me, look, you're wrong. We measured it. It's over. You're out. All right, man. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. I can live with that. And that's what we don't have right now. We have a system of, um, you know, well, okay, you go through again. We're going to dock you some practice time. We're going to take away your car, Chief. You know? You're saying send them to the back the first time they uh, yeah, they, or, they, they, they or something even more severe. Even or, more severe than that. Start them a lap down. How about that? More. I mean, Oof. you got to give them hell, man. you got to go hard. Man, I hear you. They will make sure that this car is going to pass this particular rule. Don't even get on the edge. Yeah. They, because it's, t- it's too dangerous. The teams can do that, but they don't have to do that. They're not being held to that a standard. They're, they're not, you know, they're, 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 they're in a, it's a culture of, let me just push it as hard as I can get. Let me push it as far, as close to that borderline as I can go. Whereas it needs to be a culture of, I ain't getting close to that. No, nah, because I know what happens. I ain't getting close to that. You know, I'm not going to push it that far because that's, I'm, I can't afford to to lose this battle. I can't afford to break this rule. Way up oh, the out. racetrack goes the 10 of Almirola. 22 of Logano and Almirola both up the racetrack. Eric Almirola blaming Joey Logano for getting him loose. Said he was on his door real tight. But damn, how can you expect it? How can you expect a guy to race like that? Right. Exactly. Thank you. You're racing. I thought Amarola was so off on this one. I'm like, did you watch the replay? I mean, it's like, yes, they're side by side. Don't knock the one side by side race we got going on. <laughs> the one, there's one side by side race, and we're going to be like, he did wrong. He should have raced me different. He should have got a while. No. <laughs> <laughs> he Amarola's ex- explanation on this was simply like, he got side by he got on my door. <laughs> yes, it's what you're supposed to do, it's isn't called it? Called racing. I'll be. Uh, let me clear up something. So if a guy goes down in the corner and he drives literally inches off your car, that's a bad. That's something that drivers don't really appreciate. That's not what happened in this situation. I'm thinking that Eric thought the 22 was really close to him and was taking the side force off his car. He wasn't. He was actually a good distance away from him. He couldn't actually get any higher. He would have been in the damn, you know, he'd have been in the damn marbles spinning out. He was as high as he could possibly be. They went off in the corner, and it never changed. Joey never got to his door so much so that it would have spun him right around. Um, but I think that that's what Eric felt because Eric got loose and said, hey, he's, he's only, he had to have been crowding me because there's no way I would have gotten loose. He had to have been on my door. He's thinking this, right? And so he... He vents right on. He hits the mic. He's falling back. He's lost these spots. He know he's in, he's he's a, he's mad, ashamed, or embarrassed one uh, to his team. So he hits the mic. This is what I've done a million times. He hits the mic and he goes, "That guy, blah, whatever comes out, right?" He's already going to Homestead and he wants to race me like that. Uh, he made it obviously really difficult on me today, um, which was really unnecessary. He could have run fourth, fifth, eleventh. It wouldn't have mattered. Uh, he's still going to go to Homestead and race for a championship. It's just not smart. That is such a bad point of view because jam. I mean, everybody's there to try to win that race. I don't care what the playoff situation is. Maybe I've said, have I ever said that? I don't want this to come back on me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever remember saying that. That guy should have never raced me that hard because he's already won or he don't need no, to win today. Look, I, I cannot think of any. I, if anything, you've always taken the position, even when you guys have mixed up, you mix it up with somebody, you've always been like, well, that was fun. You've always took the fun route, <laughs> which is to, to a fault, maybe. But, uh, but you know, I, I, I can't recall. Maybe fans can help us out on that one. If Dale Jr.'s ever whine, whined about another driver. That would be – this would be what I would Racing want. him too yeah. hard. Or about anything. I would like to uh, see fans 
fans' opinions on when I might have been, when was I the farthest off base on anything? Hey, we're live. Are we live? Yeah. We got a thumbs up over there. All right, everybody, you're, I guess you see us on YouTube here. Somebody f- chiming in from the UK uh, noticed uh, when you used to drive on the ovals, you put both of your hands at times to one side when you turn the wheel. Just wondering why you did that and uh, how you uh, held the wheel typically on a road course. Uh, on a road course, I would drive 10 and 2. Unless it was a big corner, then I might, you know, get over here and tug on it like this. Uh Mark Martin drove that way. They called it the Arkansas pull. Where he was like this? Yeah. yeah. And so you drive down a straightaway, and as you're starting to go into the corner, you move your hand over here, and you're just, you just get more leverage on that steering wheel, and you just go to town uh, getting that thing worked through the center of the corner. If I drove like this, I don't know. I, I couldn't do that through the corner. It was just felt weird to have your hand up here in your way. I don't know. Uh, it's the way I always drove. I think my father drove the same way. And... For me, I think you know. I, I think it's it's not an old school way. It's just a different way because I've seen guys from uh, in car cameras of the 70s and 80s driving at 10 and 2. Uh, Brad Keselowski drives this way, and I've tried it in a test, and it's weird. You get you know you get used to doing it one way, and you can't really ever you can't change those those habits. Uh, Colby Chancellor uh, chiming in, Dale. Uh, what do you think led to the culture change, so to say? of hard racing drivers of the 80s and 90s and the gentlemen, let's talk and get along, slash whiners that we have the last two years? <laughs> That's oh, a bold man, question. that is a bold question. Um, there's a lot that's changed in the sport. You know, we all live in the, we, li- we all live together on the weekends in these motorhome lots, and the drivers um, spend a lot of time in close proximity to each other. Social media, media in general. So if you get into it with a guy, you better be ready to be seeing, hearing, reading, talking, being asked about, discussing that issue for quite a while. It doesn't it's not over and done. Like if you run over a guy and spin him out uh for a win, you're gonna hear about it for the rest of that week. And then when you go to that track again six months later, you're gonna see all those clips and and they're going to be running that stuff and promoting that race, using all that stuff over and over again, and you're probably going to get asked about it when you go back uh, to that racetrack. So I think that that might, in a way, s- deter guys from going through that process. You know, um, I know it certainly wasn't a lot of fun for me whenever it happened. Anytime I was caught up in any kind of tr- controversy, it was more pain in the ass than anything. Um You know, so I tried to avoid that as much as possible. Race car drivers want to race. We don't mind knocking each other out of the way for wins, but dealing with the repercussions and the public perception afterwards and the the noise, you know, in the media throughout the week, the rest of the week can can be can be difficult. How often do drivers get mad and scream in the car without actually keying up? I don't know. We don't know. Do we know? How would we know? Would a tree? Would you? If if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, do you hear? I mean, what, what, <laughs> what kind of question is that? I've done that. Like oh, there so, you go. Okay, so this goes back to the, um, you know, the drivers of today being different than the drivers of the past. Like, I would get so sick of hearing about, I would get so sick of hearing people talk about or play or complain about my comments on my own radio during a race that a lot of times I just quit talking on the radio. And, you know, when I wanted to complain or about something or, you know, be whiny, I just stopped doing it. And it's, And I would just... You know, I would just scream or cuss instead of keying the mic. I just cuss and raise hell in there by myself. Oh, to own, to have a a recording of the yeah. of the of the of those moments when he's not keying the mic. That would be hysterical. Yeah, there's times when I've mf'd Tony Tony's. certain people, and they <laughs> yeah, they'll never know. Tony Junior, yeah. Tony Senior, probably got caught know. it. Your your transmissions were gold back in the eight days. Well, the ones you heard. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I just a, a little quick break in the action. I had put out there uh, for some help on Twitter, uh, come up with the time when Dale Jr. was a whiny baby, 
and, oh, and, and, and his assertion was wrong, and nobody can really come up with anything. I think that we were right in this, that we can't think of anything. They said, well, not Dale, but his fans. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so that's, that's fun. But we're not talking about the fans. We're talking about Dale. Y'all are being too nice now. This is your moment to really say what you Lay think. Lay into it. Yeah. I, I'm give trying to hell. encourage that. Come on. Right. Give He's giving you permission to give him hell. Just give when, him hell. When was he wrong and he was just and, – and it's, 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 it's happened many times. We, we, listen, we'll be uh, – full disclosure, we were talking about Amarola – complaining about Joey Logano, and we didn't think that Logano did anything wrong. Yeah. He was just racing him, and he says that Logano shouldn't have been racing him that way because Logano's already locked in. And we're like, well, you can't ask a race car driver to do something like not race hard. So we were like, when has Dale Jr. ever been just kind way of a, a, a – Yeah, just way off. And, and uh, every time – we have had times when you have, you know, called somebody a nickname or yeah. called him – but, but you, you feel like you were well justified because you got wrecked, and that's true. Yeah. Somebody said the time at Michigan with Mark Martin. I don't remember the events, but I remember ah. you saying you were pissed off. So that was way off. They felt like I was way off. They thought you were yeah. way off. I remember this. We were racing at Michigan, and coming off of turn two, Mark ran me in the fence. I had to lift and lost a handful of spots, six spots or something. I'd been running eighth all day long, all day long, and then I was going to finish 14th. And I was so mad because – I want to finish where I think I'm supposed to finish, and Marcus was my teammate. Yeah. And he came off the corner like, hey, I remember that. you're not even there. Yeah. <laughs> Screw you. I remember that. And so I got out of the car, and I said, damn it, Mark. Burr, burr, burr. I try really hard to take care of people, try not to be careless, and I don't like putting up with carelessness, and that just really pissed me off what happened out there. So. And everybody was like, what, Mark? No, no, Mark don't do that. Mark never do that, man. Come on. Yeah. And uh, even Mark was like, I don't really remember that. So, but I appreciate you. Somebody found one that they thought I was way off. Whether that you know, that's what we wanted. Yeah, there we go. Trying to be honest. Trying to be transparent. I remember after that, after I said that, most people were like, "You're way off." I remember that. I remember the reaction that week to those comments were, "Junior, you know, just hush." So I remember. I, so maybe, maybe a lot of other people might agree with this guy. Dale, anything uh, you want to close us down with? I think we had a great show. Thanks for everybody for listening. Um, anything incorrect or you, that you disagree with, keep your Screw mouth you. shut. That's right. I don't even want to hear. Don't even want to hear it, you drivers. <laughs> you whiny drivers. <laughs> See ya. See ya.